drunkenness, often viewed in society as a very acceptable sin. In fact, even in many Christian circles, it can be viewed, at least on occasion, as an acceptable sin. The notion is, maybe you're allowed to get drunk, just not blackout drunk. You're allowed to lose some control, just don't harm anyone. Someone might even say, hey, you you got super drunk last night, and you decided to take public transport instead of driving? You're a virtuous man. You've done right. You've done well. That's what Uber's for. And ever since alcoholic drink was introduced to humanity, sinners have used and abused it. You remember after the great flood subsided and God made a covenant with Noah and his family promising all humanity that he would never flood the earth again. What do we read in Genesis 9.20? Noah began to be a man of the soil, which is not a bad thing, that's a good thing. He became a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. And if you stop at that verse, you're saying, oh wow, this is it. Cultivate the land, right? Work the soil. That is the, the charge given to Adam in the garden. And he planted, this man, Noah, planted a vineyard. And that vineyard's good because throughout the Old Testament, the image of a vineyard is used to speak of God's purpose for his people. Such as Isaiah 5, 7, the vineyard of the Lord is the, of the, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Yet Israel was not a very good vineyard. She failed to produce good fruit. And so much like their ancestor Noah, they did not do right according to God. After Noah planted that vineyard, we see the next verse, Genesis 9.21. He drank of the wine. So he learned to make wine. There's a lot of stuff happening in between here. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. A good thing. A good thing that would be continuously commended throughout the Old Testament as a blessing, as a gift. A good thing used the wrong way goes bad. So let's remember what we learned in Proverbs last week at the end of chapter 19. Wisdom must not only be heard, but heeded. Not only acknowledged, but accepted. And we are a church that understands, thankfully, that wine is not evil. In fact, no substance or chemical is inherently evil. We, we know that when Adam took of the fruit and ate it and sinned against God, it's not that the, the fruit was evil, it's that he used it wrong. He disobeyed his God. And wine is a blessing from God. Our Lord used wine. Many people don't drink wine today, and that's perfectly fine. In the first century, at the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, you might even say, people simply did not have the luxury of abstinence from alcoholic drink. They didn't have the luxury of having such clean water as you are all drinking. Oftentimes, the wine was a much better option as a regular drink than water that was available during those days. You read the Old Testament, it was the norm. Everyone partook of this, including our Lord. And it can be enjoyed properly when you have wisdom. But Proverbs 20 verse 1 shows us what happens to the one without wisdom, who takes this good thing, but then allows himself to be led astray by wine and strong drink. The person who indulges in the mockery of drunkenness. So far be it from us to be a church that rightfully understands the liberty that belongs to Christians to be able to have alcohol, but far be it from us to affirm that without also so clearly and vehemently denouncing drunkenness as an abomination, as a sin against God, as a mockery. The wisdom of God instructs us both negatively and positively. 
So our Lord wants us to know what we shouldn't do as well as what we should do. And I think Paul in Ephesians 5.18 captures this very well. And I've made this sort of the big idea or the message of the sermon you'll find in your liturgy. Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So we'll look at both the negative and positive teachings of the Scriptures on the sin of drunkenness as we study Proverbs 20 verse 1. We'll see that the fool is led astray by wine, but then secondly, the wise are led by the Spirit. So firstly, the fool is led astray by wine. We read in Proverbs 20 verse 1, wine is a mocker. A mocker is a babbler also translated a scoffer. Back in Proverbs 14, verse 9, fools mock at the guilt offering. Proverbs 19, 28, a worthless witness mocks at justice. It's scoffing, it's mocking at these good things. So when wisdom says wine is a mocker, it's not actually speaking of the liquid, it's speaking of a kind of person. Wine isn't alive, it's not a person, it can't mock, it can't scoff. The mocker is the person who is led astray by wine. He gives in to excess, he gets intoxicated, he gets drunk, and he begins to mock, he begins to brag to speak boastfully, to deride, to scorn people. Most people know what a stereotypical drunk person looks and sounds like. They start to become loose. Things that aren't usually said in public are now openly said. Their speech becomes slurred. And then for some, anger. The anger that's hidden deep inside, the, the inhibitions are released and now the anger comes out and maybe even violence. Wine is a marker, strong drink, a brawler. Strong drink, what is that? Um, strong drink is what's used in ESV, KJV, the NASB. Um, oh, sorry, in KJV. The NASB translates it as simply intoxicating drink. Interestingly, the NIV translates it beer. The NLT translates it alcohol. So you know what this is showing us? And these are valid. This proverb isn't really about categorizing two different kinds of alcohol. The Hebrew word for strong drink, shekar, is used generally just to mean something that makes drunk or to make drunk. And that actually technically covers wine too. Wine falls under that category. It can make drunk. And when the priest Eli, in 1 Samuel, saw Hannah when she was praying to God and she was only moving her lips and it looked kind of strange, he thought that she was drunk in 1 Samuel 1.12 and Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Which is the verb form of shekar. Put your wine, same word as the proverb that we're reading, yayin, wine, away from you. So the point is, whether it be wine, the common word yayin for fermented grape, it's wine, or strong drink, shekhar, the point is, these are intoxicating beverages. And when used unwisely, when used sinfully, they cause drunkenness. To abuse them not only brings about that sin of drunkenness, drunkenness pretty much always begets more sin. So when you fall to the sin of drunkenness, your inhibitions are released, the usual moral ethical boundary starts to corrode, you start thinking things you don't normally think about, you start saying things you don't normally say, you start doing things you wouldn't normally be brave enough to do, yes, even sinful things that you would not normally do. Again, oftentimes generalizations and stereotypes have much truth to them. So the stereotypical young person goes out to party, gets drunk, finds someone to sleep with, has a one-night stand, 
Th that, that is not just a stereotype in the movies. That's actually a thing that very commonly happens in society. Drunkenness lends itself towards that kind of debauchery. It is a mockery, says Proverbs 20 verse 1. And then Paul in Ephesians 5.18 calls it, calls drunkenness, debauchery. What is debauchery? Reckless abandon. Wild living. Young and wild and free. And many professing Christians have no problem with occasional debauchery. Occasional drunkenness. It's a special celebration. Go for it. You, you don't do this much. You're not an alcoholic. It's just to let loose. You've earned it. You've graduated. Whatever it may be. It's a bucks party. That's what you do at a box party. Of course you're going to drink in excess. Of course you've got to have a little bit of drunkenness. Yet, the Bible categorically prohibits drunkenness full stop. Turn forward a few pages to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23 verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Look what's being described here. Those who tarry long over wine. Those who go to try mixed wine. Look at the imagery. Look, look at the vividness. Do not look at wine when it is red when it sparkles in the cup and it goes down smoothly, it's, it, it seems like a commercial, right? Just like you see on the YouTube ads, because if I say on the TV, who really still watches commercials on TV? Very small demographic. This is how it's marketed, right? In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. This is the one who was led astray by wine or by strong drink. A mocker, a brawler. This is the one who is intoxicated, the one who is drunk, the one who has given over their self-control and is now under the influence and control of strong drink. Alcohol, when used wrongly, can be very, very destructive. Some of you, like myself, know this personally. I was what modern society would categorize as a drug addict, an alcoholic. And perhaps one of the things that were always told to me in my Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous meetings that actually affirmed me in my slavery was this. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Once an addict, always an addict. And on top of that, this was the clincher, this was the big one that I think in many ways actually kept me the way that I was. A very sinister ideology. What you have, Josh, is a disease. Now, I'm not saying we can't ever speak of the biological, chemical aspects of alcoholism, but the message that was conveyed to me was, it's a disease, you can't help it. It's just like having cancer. Would you ever blame someone for having cancer? It's an illness. And I was told, it's normal to relapse. And you bring back more demons when it happens, so you just have to be vigilant. You just have to keep attending the meetings. You need to latch on to a HP, the higher power, as they say. And although Alcoholics Anonymous was founded on very much Christian principles, it didn't used to be HP. And now it was vague. A higher power can even be a person. And what often happened with this kind of ideology was it allows people at times 
to release themselves from moral and ethical responsibilities for their wrongdoing, for their sins. I didn't remember. I was, you know, I w- it was one of those relapses. Somebody will say, you need, to be, you, need to, you need to just accept that your husband has a disease. I know he's abusive. I know he's violent. I know that he's crazy. I know that he's doing all of these things. But you can't blame him. He's sick. He's an alcoholic. Yet alcoholism in the Bible, which is a thing, there is a phrase in the New Testament, do not be addicted to much wine. There is such a thing as addiction. There's much to be said about chemicals and dependency and about our human brains. There's much to be said about those things. We need to be sensitive about those things. But none of those things removes the reality that drunkenness is a moral sin against God. It is something that you do. It is a sin that you commit and you are responsible for your actions even when you are drunk. So if a guy gets drunk because he has a disease that he can't shake off and he ends up murdering his entire family, what if, in that circumstance, what do we say? Oh, but he's just sick. No, he's a murderer. Yes, he's a drunk and he's a murderer. We cannot be excused. Every time you see someone get drunk in the Old Testament, it doesn't end well. It just never does. In fact, even though alcohol was commended to Israel, priests were warned not to drink alcohol before going in and conducting their temple services, Leviticus 10. Because of the holy and sacred nature of what they're about to do, they need to be clear-headed in all things. Kings too. They need clarity for making sound judgments. In fact, that's mentioned in Proverbs 31. So this topic of alcohol and drunkenness and how an entire industry exists today to actually get people hooked on alcohol is a topic that really showcases the corrupting power of sin. Why do I say that? Are there a lot of passages in the Bible that denounce drunkenness? Oh, there's heaps. But imagine this. The drunkenness was such a huge problem that it's addressed so many times and it's such a huge problem in society today, yet on the flip side, you've got passages like Psalm 104, verses 14 to 15 that says, To God, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man. Do you see that? That's why God gave it. That's why in His providence it was introduced to His people. It's because His intention was for this to be used to gladden the heart of man. And those who understand self-control and alcohol know this, know this idea. Uh, Even in the Old Testament, many of the feasts, not in excess, not supposed to be in excess, would have wine. You see the wedding feast of Jesus, there was wine. He turned water into wine, not just any, it's the good wine. And how there's this celebratory um, ethos to having this drink with people, but so easily does it turn into debauchery. What a sad reality. This is what sin does. Food and drink is supposed to be a gift, but what do we do with food? We turn the blessing of what might be a feast into gluttony. That's a sin. And then what do we do with the blessing of wine? We turn something that should gladden the heart into something that ruins the heart, causes heartbreak. We take what is a good gift from our Creator and then offend Him by using it against His design and purpose in order to gratify our own fleshly desires. And that's really why people get drunk. There is fleshly pleasure in drunkenness. And even you, who knows the liberty that you have to enjoy some beer or some wine or whatever it may be, need to be reminded of this. There is fleshly pleasure in drunkenness. It does feel good. We use it for counterfeit satisfaction. 
We use it to numb our pain instead of addressing it properly. And so, like I said, I was addicted to alcohol and drugs for many, many years. I often tell my wife that right now, in, in, in my age, I am doing everything I can with my mind because it is not uncommon for the effects of early substance abuse to catch up when you're in your later years, 40s, 50s, 60s, especially because of the gravity of the abuse that I committed. Wake up, do any number of things, whether it be cocaine or methamphetamine, marijuana was the rule of the day, that's sort of, in many ways in society, kind of replacing alcohol right now. It is the thing, especially as it becomes more and more legal all over the world. Alcohol is actually, in some places, becoming less cool. Weed is the norm. Marijuana is the norm. Especially because of its effectiveness in achieving what alcohol achieves usually, um, for a longer period of time. You need to drink quite a bit of beer to get into the state that you could get in with just a few puffs of weed. And it feels good. Why do I want to feel good? Well, for me, it was because I was empty. I was unhappy with my own self. I liked my drunk self much better than my sober self. My drunk self was much more charismatic. My Drunk self, my high self, was much more, I don't care what other, what, other, what other people think. And that's a virtue these days, right? Don't care what other people think, ever. My high self was much less self-conscious. I was unhappy with my own self and my life. I was discontent. I didn't know the Lord. Yet I knew I needed a Lord. I needed an object of my worship. Because I'm a worshiper like everyone else. So I made myself a slave to alcohol and drugs while others choose other gods, and that's normal. And there's many to choose from, many gods. And whichever you choose, it will not go well for you. Keep going, keep going, drink more, take more. Only God satisfies. The thing about sinful pleasures like drunkenness is that, yes, there is seeming satisfaction, but it is just enough to keep you coming back for more. It's like gambling as an addiction. And then you come back, and it's not enough. You lose. You come back again. Not enough. Try something else. Still not enough. It will never be enough because li idols are not life-giving. They don't have the ability. The flesh is no guide for lasting satisfaction. You can intoxicate yourself with all the wine you want. You will still be sad. You will still be unhappy. You'll wake up. and You'll realize, oh yeah, I have a real life. And that void you were trying to fill, or that sense of emptiness you were trying to get rid of, will still be there. You will not be led to anything good by it. Instead, you will become a fool who was led astray. And this is why Jesus warns us in Luke 21, verse 34, Watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day, the last day, come upon you suddenly like a trap. You know, time can just pass you by when you're a drunk. How long have I been going on this binge? I don't know. Five days? Five weeks? If you're a junkie, if you're doing drugs, a year can pass by just like that. But for the Christian, we have to ask, what is our solution? The solution or our response against drunkenness is not like that of the world. Let me share with you another thing that Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous shared with me. They essentially shared with me that my salvation was found in lifelong total abstinence. Something that I soon found was actually a very strange belief. If alcohol itself is the evil and our salvation is total abstinence from it, well, the vast majority of people that say that they are totally abstaining from all ethanol, ethanol 
I'm not actually doing so because it is very much present in lots and lots of everyday drinks and everyday foods and everyday things that we consume. But let me tell you, with such a law-centered approach to try to solve a heart problem, you know what it did to me and my peers? And I'm not completely shutting down the place of some of these meetings. They could have helped to a certain extent, but I'll tell you what it did to us, at least most of my peers. What it did was that if we were ever at a point or situation, you know, they give us these chips, the one-day chip, that's the white one. And then you get the one-month chip, three-month chip, six-month chip, nine-month chip, one-year chip, two-year chip. You get the chips, right? And what happens if you have a drink again? And your counselor, your sponsor, or whoever it is, finds out. You rock up to the meeting. Back to the white chip. Back to zero for you. It places us on this perpetual cycle of we ought to actually expect relapse. And what I mean by relapse is not actually go, not necessarily even going back to drunkenness, but ever having a drink again. Again, total abstinence is your savior. This is where salvation is found. And do you know what the problem is when your savior is something like that, a work that you do or try to maintain? You know that saying that goes, If salvation were by my own works, I would lose it every day and lose it every week. And that is what we experienced. What is the biblical solution? It is not to outright reject the reality that wine remains a good gift from God. The fool is led astray by wine. But here's the second point. The wise are led by the Spirit. Yes, it is true. If we are just talking about human psychology and biology and all of those things and the way the brain works, then yeah, in the world, maybe the best solution for some people is just to to never have a drink again. I can sympathize with that. Because when you are intoxicated by alcohol, you give over self-control. Sound judgment begins to slip away from you. You are no longer sober-minded. And before you know it, you are making unsound decisions. Like the priests and the prophets who were rebuked in Isaiah 28 verse 7 because they are swallowed with wine and stagger with strong drink to the point that they stumble in giving judgment. But the opposite is true when you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with with the Spirit. So the solution that's given is instead of losing control under the influence of alcohol or really any idol, any substance, the one filled with the Holy Spirit can now exercise this Christian virtue called self-control, which is last on the list of the fruit of the Spirit that we find in Galatians chapter 5. Turn there with me, Galatians chapter 5, so we can see the the rotten fruit of the flesh as compared to the good fruit produced by the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Stop there. There is your biblical solution. That is what is provided for us. It's not just run away from the substances. Run away, run away, run away. No, there's an actual solution provided by a good and gracious God. Walk by the Spirit, and if you do that, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You'll not give in to things like drunkenness. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So, I mean, just like think about this very realistically and very practically, right? People who are coming off of a long period of alcoholism, they have withdrawals. 
It's a very real thing. It's a chemical reality. You experience withdrawals. In fact, many institutions, when somebody comes in and they're going through alcohol withdrawal, they actually slip them a little bit, just enough alcohol, whether in pill form or something similar, to help them um, cope with the withdrawal. So I, I, that's a very real scientific issue. But there are much bigger issues. There are spiritual issues at play. What a person really needs is, as Thomas Chalmers, the Puritan, puts it, is that one and only thing that can put to death and eclipse the powerful, fleshly, sinful affections that rage within our hearts, and that is the expulsive power of a new affection. You need something better. You need something greater. You are right. You are not satisfied. And you are right, you do need something to fill that void. You do need something to satisfy you. And we are saying it's found in God. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Last one is self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Think about Christ, our Lord Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord was upon Him, says the Scriptures. He clearly drank wine. He was a normal, true, blue, old covenant Jew. The fruit of the vine was used in the institution of the Lord's Supper. And we know it is not grape juice. It was the consecrated wine of the Passover. That was Passover week and weekend. Yet we are confident that our Lord never gave in to excess. He never fell to the sin of drunkenness. He never sinned. He's sinless. His holiness was seen, listen to this, not in His total abstinence from alcohol or things that may, if used wrongly, bring sin, his holiness instead was seen in his perfect control over his thoughts and deeds, his careful self-control when using that thing that could potentially intoxicate but is nevertheless a blessing from God. See, what we may be implicitly teaching in the total absolute abstinence movement is that you will never learn self-control. And that is your lot. You are a slave to your lack of self-control. That's it. End of story. You have no hope. There is no growth in the Christian virtue of self-control for you. Your only solution, your only salvation is to have, to run away and to never again, to never again partake of this thing that we see in the scriptures, to never again have anything to do with it. The, the problem with that, and, and there are times where you just got to do that. You just got to run away. You just got to stay away. You just got to not go to any of those box parties anymore. You just don't want to be exposed to any of those things because there's other sins connected to it as well. But to, sh to say that the Christian solution to something like drunkenness is merely total abstinence does not stand the test of any of the other sins in the scriptures. Lust is a problem. So is our solution to the men, young men, don't ever talk to a girl again. You be, the, the next time you ever have anything longer than a 30-minute conversation must with a woman, it better be on your wedding day with your wife. And that's, that's it. Because it, it could potentially lead to lust. 31 seconds is just too much. Cut it short. Do not grow in any kind of relationship, even a normal Christian relationship within the church with the opposite sex. And did you know that there's actually movements like that? 
It's actually movements that teach men to stick with the boys. Stick with the men. Don't talk to those ladies. They're just trying to entice you. No such thing as a, any kind of friendly and real relationship with the opposite sex. Just stick to the men and that's it. Self-control, not blind avoidance of something that the Bible even commends. Self-control is a Christian virtue. The fruit of the Spirit. Speaking of commending wine to us, one of the prophecies about the new covenant in Christ uses wine to highlight the deep satisfaction and pleasure that is found by those whom the Lord calls to Himself. Isaiah 25 verse 6, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. God draws our attention to it. He is not calling upon us to throw it out of society or throw it out of our lives, but He is calling us to denounce drunkenness. He is calling us to denounce the kind of cultural norms that make this sin of debauchery acceptable. But in light of a prophecy like that, no wonder Jesus' first sign in the Gospel of John was turning water into wine at a wedding banquet. Because the kingdom of God is likened in the Gospels to a wedding banquet. And Jesus is the bridegroom who welcomes us into uh, an eternal feast where there is food to fill our stomachs and wine to gladden our hearts. This pictures how the gift of wine was originally intended to be a gift and blessing. It was, if it wasn't a blessing, God would be quite wrong to liken the joy of salvation to the joy of gathering in the courts of His sanctuary and drinking wine, as we see in Isaiah 62. Oh, I'll say that again. Isaiah 62, you can look it up if you want later on, verses 8 and 9. God likens the joy of our salvation to the joy of gathering in the courts of His sanctuary and there drinking wine. A wine that we should not abstain from, but should come to and drink with gladness. I'm talking about spiritual wine, of course. The problem lies with us. It's our sin that turns the blessing into a curse. It is our lack of the virtue of self-control that makes a good thing bad. Wine is a gift, but the Holy Spirit is an even greater gift given to those who belong to the Lord. Never, wine, never mind wine for a second. The Holy Spirit is a gift from God who enables us to repent of our sins and believe in Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, the giver of all good gifts, the giver of eternal life. And this Holy Spirit grows the Christian, strengthens us spiritually, produces fruit in us such as self-control. So, someone who is given over to drunkenness is allowing something, whatever it may be, anything, to master them. I will not be enslaved. I will not have any of these things master over me, says the Apostle Paul. And if this marks your life, a life of drunkenness or dissipation or debauchery or giving over self-control to something else, being mastered by something else, it may actually be because you do not have the Spirit of God living in you. These people are slaves to sin. And they need the one who breaks the shackles of sin. They are addicted to something because they do not know the all-satisfying pleasures of Christ. So, so yeah... I mean, maybe you need a treatment center. Maybe you need a detox. If you're an alcoholic, if you're a drug addict, maybe you need to go to a program. Maybe you, maybe you do need to make use of these sometimes very useful things that are available in the world. But more than anything, you need the Holy Spirit of God. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to find a greater affection, a greater sat satisfaction in the one who brings everlasting pleasures. You need to turn to Christ, crucified for drunks, for addicts, for those who have no self-control, 
for those who have lived lives of debauchery. You need to go to Him, the Son of God, the Savior of sinners who laid down His life on the cross. Yes, wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray is not wise. So we all, drunk with our sin, mocked Christ. We brawled against Him in drunk hatred and anger. We were led astray by our sin. Christ was mocked on His way to the cross as the soldiers brawled against Him, beating Him to the point that would make any man senseless, no more sound judgment. Yet Jesus continued to be sober-minded all the way to the cross with a singular mission. And He drank the wine of God's wrath so that we could drink of the wine of salvation, a wine that truly gladdens the heart. In our scripture reading, we are told we are not to go back to that old life of drunkenness. What is mentioned there as well in Peter is drinking parties. What is that? It's the act of prolonged drinking in excess. Basically, where people get together to get drunk. There's many of them. You can go to pretty much any wine all across Melbourne, right? It's a normal thing. Brethren, we may not be called to abstain from alcohol, but we are clearly called to abstain from these nights of revelry. Parties where drunkenness is celebrated. For young men and women, even those in university, This continues to be a normal thing in your context. It's a normal thing among your peers. In the Bible, the Spirit of God calls you to have nothing to do with this debauchery. Christian, just because you are now in Christ and you've got the Holy Spirit doesn't mean, even after all the good things that's been said about God commending the gift of wine and even strong drink throughout the Old Testament, this does not mean you can just let your God down. What you need is to gain wisdom, to learn self-control. And, and, and by the help of the Spirit, you do just need to know when to say no. You need to know your own personal limitations. So for the members of this church, this is an interesting conversation because whatever your background was, whatever it was, you now partake of at least some alcohol at the Lord's table. It's just a part of your church life now. And this is our Lord's holy ordinance. And you have very visible accountability here. And this is what we were saying about being led by the Spirit Walk with the Spirit so you don't gratify the sins of the flesh. Realistically, okay, just realistically, could you really envision anybody getting drunk at our Lord's table? Uh, The the fact that it's a very small amount aside, is that even a, a realistic scenario? When we are in the middle of the worship of God, when we have a a public gathering, when we are all here at the table, Christians who know and love the Lord, and when there is such clear-cut accountability, and, and that's why the Bible, I think, calls us to beware of those contexts, those things which are still in the darkness, those nights of revelry, and yes, even some of those debaucherous bucks parties. Because God knows, in the context of the church, in the context of worship. I mean, could it happen? Well, you just got to read 1 Corinthians. It, it could happen. 1 Corinthians clearly says that some of these guys were using the Lord's Supper meal as a time to get drunk. But isn't it interesting that Paul's solution there was for them to repent and make things right and to seek the grace of God, and it wasn't, how about just cut off the wine? See, Paul's a consistent man of God. He wants to promote the virtue of self-control because things like total abstinence will only get you so far. You're not dealing with the real problem. You need the virtue of self-control. I hope you believe that your pastors will certainly not let anyone here desecrate the Lord's table by turning it into a drinking party through drunkenness. 
But I say this, if you believe that you are weak and you lack self-control and you want to refrain from alcoholic beverages, not here, but in your everyday normal life, that is up to your discretion. That is up to your discretion and it may even be best for some. Just don't let your fear of going too far in this and sinning ever then keep you from coming to the Lord's table and partaking of the fruit of the vine as our Lord Jesus instituted for your benefit. One of the interesting questions that I sometimes pose when people find out about the practice that we have of using fermented grape, um, most people are willing to concede, yeah, Jesus most likely used actual wine because it was the fruit of the vine, because it was the Passover consecrated thing. We get that. But when we go back and forth, sometimes I just like to ask, in this personal, total abstinence conviction of yours, which I'm not trying to get into your personal life. You want to do this personally, that's fine. But here's an interesting question. Are you saying that if the Lord Jesus, or if you were alive in the days of the Lord Jesus, and you were so blessed to be able to be a part of that upper room encounter with him, and he called upon you to partake of the bread and to drink of the fruit of the vine, that you would deny your Lord Jesus Christ and say, I can't because of a personal conviction. I know it sounds silly, but it gets us to think, what is godliness? What is Christian virtue? What is our response to the drunkenness of this world? And our response is to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ who heals us who makes us new, who gives us the Holy Spirit that we may know how to live. As one who was once addicted to alcohol, the Lord's Supper to me right now, of course, subordinate to the most important thing that is communion with Christ, but it is a constant reminder to me that the wine for me was never the real problem. It was my heart. It was my sin. It was because I didn't have Christ. So for all of us, as we once again come to the table, let's remember that outside of Christ, we would all easily be counted among the gluttons and the drunkards. Well, what do you have but the flesh without Him? And many of us were exactly these things because we were dead. We didn't have the life-giving spirit. But remember, believer, the fruit of the vine represents Christ's blood shed for you to wash away your sins, to give you life through His death, to make you a new creation. What a very appropriate way to transition to the sacrament of communion. May this physical wine that gladdens your physical heart help you to enjoy the spiritually wine abundantly available to you in Christ, which makes your heart glad for eternity. Let's pray.